but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. But can you trust these things that are written? How does someone from 2,000 years ago know how I feel today? And so much has changed in the last year, let alone 2,000 years. Why do we still listen to Jesus' teachings? Is his teaching relevant today? Before I was a Christian, I'd heard about the claims Jesus made. But many other religions also claim such things. The big question for me is, are his claims unique? The more I read about Jesus, the more I realized that if the accounts of his life were true, then he is the most incredible person to have walked this earth. So for me, the question was always, is this true? Is the ancient evidence reliable? These questions of the heart are the exact ones we will be looking into during our sermon series, Is Jesus History? Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, wow, the guy doing the voiceover and the guy on screen both sound like they're from the same place. And that's because we are. Well, I am. I'm from the Eastern Cape. And what I've realized between Eastern Cape and Cape Tonians is that we don't say things particularly the same way. So I don't say like, I say like. Um, I don't say I, I say ah. So every time I say I'm going to the eye doctor, um, Cape Tonians just kind of look at me weirdly. And I don't say life, I say la. So that would explain why I pronounced laugh like that in the voiceover before. Um, but before I say any more words the wrong way, uh, if we have never met before, my name is Joe. And whether you're a regular or first time, I am super glad that you are viewing the stream. Might I say perfect timing as well, because you are joining us for the last week of our sermon series in John. And also right before we kick off our new sermon series is Jesus History. So I'm going to give you something to look forward to for next week's Sunday now as it will be the first Sunday in this new sermon series. And the great thing about the sermon series is that it's invite friendly. It will be online so you can forward the Sunday link to friends and family if you want to invite them to listen in. Now speaking of family, um, I've got some good news and I've got some unfortunate news. The unfortunate news is that due to the rise in COVID-19 cases, we have had to cancel our Summer Fest holiday club. But the good news is that Kids Sunday videos are back and they are back with a twist. So kids, be sure to click on the video that pops up at the end of the stream to see what Caitlin has in store for you. Also, if you haven't heard, tonight we are holding an online prayer meeting and you are invited. It would be amazing if you could join us. It's been a while since we've gathered and this is a great opportunity for us to clock off a few minutes of our time, jump onto Zoom and pray as brothers and sisters in Christ. The link will be sent out via email and put on the WhatsApp groups. However, if you are new to the stream and we don't have your details, but you would like to join us, please email this address and we will send the link to you. Now, like I said, it has been a while since we have met in person and a lot of things feel uncertain. But during these times of uncertainty, it's important for you and I to remember what is certain and what is true. Now, a prayer is going to come up on screen uh, and I want to encourage you to reflect on the words and pray them with me in your heart or aloud. In the midst of whatever follows, O Lord, let me meet your mercies anew, and anew, and anew. In the midst of my dismay, fix my eyes again and again upon your eternal promises. How this ends, that is up to you. If the next news is favorable, I will praise you for the ongoing gift of life. If tomorrow's tidings are worse, still I will proclaim your goodness, my heart anchored ever more firmly in the eternal joys you have set before me. And when, whether days or decades from now, you finally bid me rise and follow you across the last valley, I will rejoice in your faithfulness, even there, especially there, praying thy will be done, and trusting by faith that it will be done, that it is being done, even now, even in this disquiet. I am utterly yours, O Christ. In the midst of this uncertainty, I abandon myself again to you, the author and the object of all my truest hopes. Amen. Our Father who in heaven reigns, how great and mighty is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now here on earth, 
presence is above. Oh, give to us our daily bread and keep our hungry spirits fed. May all our satisfaction. taken from John chapter 1 verse 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life 
was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Well, good morning, afternoon or evening, whenever you're watching the stream. I'm Carl Pino, one of the pastors of St. Peter's Church, and it's really a privilege to share God's word with you from John chapter 1, verse 14 to 18, the end of the prologue. We're not going to look at the entire gospel. We're actually going to start a new series, as you heard in the stream. But I'd really like to encourage you that after this sermon, after this prologue series, that you actually take the time during this lockdown or during this first term to actually just read John's gospel for yourself and see how the claims made in verses 1 to 18 are true about Jesus. But as we look at the last part of this prologue, let's pray that God's Spirit would lead us and guide us. So let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the privilege that we can still connect with one another in some way through this stream, that we can share God's Word with one another, this beautiful gospel that you've given us. But we know it's inspired by you. And Father, ultimately it's you that interprets your own words and makes them alive and real to our hearts by the Spirit. And so we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would lead us and guide us and enable us to understand and know and grasp what is being said at this moment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you've asked this question for yourself or these questions. How can I know God? And if I can know God, what is God actually like? And is it even possible to know God, be in a relationship with Him? Although these questions pop up on various websites today, you just have to Google them and you'll see. They're actually ancient questions asked by people throughout the centuries. And multiple answers have been given. But there are generally two answers given to these questions. Now the first answer is, and some have argued, like Greek philosophers like Plato and Seneca, is that we can know God by just knowing ourselves, since, as they assume, we, are, we have sparks of the divine in us. So in that sense, knowing you is knowing God. In 21st century pop culture, it's put like this. Why would you look outside yourself for who is in you, who is you already? And so, through your own thinking, your own feelings, your own reason and experience, you can know God. Now, the second answer given is another popular avenue, and that is to explore nature. Many believe they can know God by just looking at the universe, meaning God is in the stars, the wind and the waves, the mountains and valleys, the trees and the rocks. Many advocate for intelligent design, that this universe seems fine-tuned, it's orderly which must be pointing to a supreme architect of the system, some genius clockmaker that's made the universe tick. Some even claim that God is the system, the universe. So the more I know nature, the more I can know God, the one who designed it, who is it as well. 
Now here's the thing, the reason both these avenues, both these answers appeal to people throughout the centuries and today is because they have a grain of truth in them. But very importantly, just a grain. According to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 27, people are created in God's image. Humanity was supposed to mirror God to the world. That's how we've been created, designed. Moreover, in Psalm 19 verse 1, it affirms, and many other passages in the Bible, that creation testifies to God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Yet, that is not the full picture. If our understanding of God is based on people and ourselves alone, then we see a very distorted picture, don't we? We know people lie, they cheat, steal, hurt, murder. People justify whatever they want to do, even if it means hurting those around them to get what they want. And if you base your view of God on people alone, then you need to ask yourself, is that what God is like? I mean, is God like me? If our understanding is based on nature alone, then our picture is also very distorted. This orderly world that we see is also pretty chaotic. It's filled with death, natural disasters, disease, erosion. It's broken. As beautiful as the mountains and oceans are, they are very, as we know, dangerous and unpredictable. Now, the scripture affirms two realities. Yes, God has created humanity and the universe and everything in it. But humanity has rebelled against their original purpose to mirror God. And as a consequence, creation has been subjected to the curse of futility and decay. You can go read about it in Genesis chapter 3 and Romans chapter 8 verse 21 to 20 to 21. So to use an analogy, if people and creation are like a painting... Human rebellion sin was like turpentine that smudged and ruined it. We don't see the artist in the painting as it should be. It's distorted now. And anyone who takes the care to look at people and the world around them will know there's something wrong with this painting. It doesn't look right. But why and how to fix it? We don't know. Not by ourselves. The good news of John's Gospel and actually all the Gospels, it reveals to us this, is that the Word, who is God, the artist of creation and people, did not leave us to guess what this painting should have been like. He has not left us in the dark to know what He is like. The claim of the Gospel is that the artist has entered into his own creation. Verse 14, the Word became flesh as the man Jesus to show us who He is and to restore His broken, ruined masterpiece. Apart from the incredible truth that God has come to dwell among us, which we looked at last week in verse 14, in the person of Jesus, the rest of verse 14 all the way to verse 18 reveals two phenomenal truths about Jesus. The first is that in Jesus, God has revealed the fullness of His grace and truth. We're going to see that in verses 14 16 to 17. The second is that, Je that in Jesus, God has made Himself known. He's revealed Himself. We see that in verse 14 and in verse 18. So starting with the first, we see that in Jesus, God revealed the fullness of His grace and truth. And I really want to encourage you to have your Bibles with you as we look at these verses together. Now in verse 14, we're told that God's one and only Son, the Word, became flesh. He made His dwelling among us. And as we read in verse 14, that He is full of grace and truth. Now this is further explained in verses 16 to 17. This is what we read in verses 16 to 17. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now this sounds great. But what does that phrase actually mean? Received grace upon grace. What does that mean? And why is verse 17 talking about the law given by Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ? What does that mean? 
Now importantly, verses 16 to 17 is not claiming, these verses are not claiming that Jesus brought something that is entirely different from the Old Testament. God did not change His mind from the Old Testament to the New Testament as if grace and truth were not revealed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is actually a testimony of God's grace and truth as well. There are so many examples. I'll just give you two. For example, in Genesis 12 to 17, God made a covenant with Abraham by grace. It was unconditional and undeserved. It was a promised gift of loyal love to Abraham and his descendants. In the Exodus, God redeemed Israel from Egypt, revealed himself at Sinai, and provided for them throughout the wilderness journey by grace. Yet what the Gospels are claiming is that that is not the fullness of God's grace and truth. The Old Testament is incomplete. It's only half of the puzzle. What the New Testament Gospels are claiming is that in Jesus, God has revealed the fullness of His grace and truth. The other half of the puzzle that actually now completes the picture for us. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus tells the religious leaders this, you search the scriptures, the Old Testament, because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me. And throughout this gospel, and you'll see it if you take the time to read it, Jesus will continue to make the point that the Old Testament was pointing to him. He completes it. For example, whereas God provided Israel manna in the wilderness, Jesus claims that he is the bread of life. That's John chapter 6. The manna, according to Jesus, was pointing to him and what he was going to do. The original manna, although it kept Israel alive in the wilderness journey, those 40 years, it could not give those people eternal life. They still died. What Jesus is offering in himself is what the manna was always pointing to, eternal life. Similarly, Another example, John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus likens himself to that snake pole Moses made in the wilderness journey. That's in the book of Numbers. Those who looked to the snake pole were saved from terrible snake bites, from death caused by the poison. It was a miracle. Yet, according to Jesus, this was just a picture of what God was going to do through him. All who looked to Jesus' work on the cross where he was hung up, who believe in who he is and what he has come to do, will be given something far greater than the healing from snake poison. He says they will be given eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3 verse 16. To use an analogy to help us understand this claim, imagine the Old Testament, the law of Moses, as a blueprint for a building or a house. If you have been involved with building, with building something, whether that's a house, maybe just an extension of your house, you know that the first step is to get an architect to draw the blueprint for you, the plan of the building. And of course, you need to get it approved. Now, on the building plans, the blueprint, you can see what the house will be like in all its dimensions, how big the rooms will be. Yet, as great as the plans are, they are not the house or the extension. In fact, the sketch is nothing in comparison to the actual house. It's only when the actual house is built that you see the plan in all its fullness and you see actually what it's like, what it's been pointing to. The blueprint, the building plan, it anticipates the building or the completion of the house. Now, in the same way, the Gospels are claiming that whereas the Old Testament is the blueprint of God's grace and truth, Jesus is the actual house, the fullness of God's grace and truth. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. In Jesus, God's grace and truth, as he puts it, is being made complete or made perfect. But here's the thing, what is, what is this grace and truth 
that's revealed in Jesus. What is the house? What has the Old Testament been pointing to? It's this. In Jesus, God has come to restore His people and creation, to remove the stain and distortion of sin, and to give what was there since the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, what we've lost, true life. Or to use Jesus' own words in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Specifically, he says in verse 28 of that same chapter, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Life where, as Jesus prays later on in chapter 17, this will happen. Those you've given me will be with me where I am to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. I mean, that's incredible. But how will he do it? Well, by going to the cross where he will absorb the penalty of sin, take upon himself the stain and ruin and distortion and consequences of, of our sin, and then triumphing over it through his resurrection life, being the first of the renewed creation, the painting as it should have been. Which leads to our second point. As we see the fullness of God's grace and truth to, in Jesus, so we will also see that in Jesus, God has made himself known or God revealed himself. Now in verse 14, if we go back to that verse, when the word became flesh, God became man, in, became the man Jesus. The apostles and John the Baptist, as he points out in verse 15, testify that we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son. Now that word glory is very important because the word glory speaks of God visibly showing the weightiness of His excellence, who He is. Now in ancient culture, the value or worthiness of something was measured by weighing it. You had to weigh it. And you weighed it on scales. You weighed it either against gold or silver or fixed weight. We even have a saying, when we say something is worth its weight in gold, we imply that it is incredibly valuable to us. It's worthy to keep, pursue, and treasure. We even say that of people. Now the term glory refers to this idea, God's weightiness, how worthy, valuable, treasured He is. Now in Jesus, this is the claim, God has shown His worthiness, His infinite weightiness, His excellence. One who should be valued, loved, and treasured, and pursued above everything and everyone else. He is revealed to be supreme. Worthy to be loved with all our heart, mind, and soul. Worthy to be trusted with our entire self. In continuing this line in verse 18, it tells us that the fullness of God's glory who He is and why we should devote ourselves to Him, why He is worthy. It's all made known in Jesus. The Word became flesh alone. In fact, it's been made known in Jesus like never before. See what He says in verse 18? Look at verse 18 with me. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is Himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, He's made Him known. In Jesus alone, God has revealed His glory, His weightiness in such a way as this gospel continues on that those who care to look and see and believe, who look to Jesus, will be filled with, as He says in John chapter 17, with the full measure of my joy within them and the love you have for me may be in them and I myself may be in them. Think about that. <laughs> When we look to Jesus, when, when we see God's glory in Jesus, His weightiness, what we will experience and what we will experience and how we will respond to God 
will be with His own love and joy. We'll experience God's own love and joy when we care to look, believe, and trust and follow Jesus. See His glory. Now, to continue the analogy of that painting, um, maybe I'm sure you've done this before. I know at the moment it's quite difficult, but when you walk into an art gallery, um, not every painting, interesting enough, catches your eye. Normally you go, for example, the Zeitz Museum, you go through all the levels and you might walk out going, I don't know whether anything catches my eye here. Because according to your standard of beauty, it's weighed and it's found wanting. So you walk on and wondering why that thing is called art. It just doesn't match for you. It doesn't weigh enough. Yet, and this usually happens, when you do come across something that catches your eye, that does match or tips the scales of your standard of beauty, what you consider beauty, it's worth its weight in gold for you, what do you do? It makes you stop. And then you keep looking at it. Let's say you've been at the Zeitz Museum. You, you linger at that level. You don't carry on. It fills you with a sense of joy and wonder and love. In fact, if you look long enough, a desire to have this painting, to keep it and treasure it. And also, if you do have it, you want to tell others about it. Why would you hang that painting in your house? You want people to see and appreciate it as well, don't you? Not just yourself. And you will do anything. If you believe it's worthy enough, you will do anything to have it. For example, in June 2020, I mean, 2020 was rough, right? Economically in every way, but... In June 2020, a painting of Francis Bacon was sold for over, guess this, over $84 million. <laughs> I mean, to the buyer, that painting was worth its weight in gold, something worth getting and treasuring at all costs, even if they are over $84 million poorer for it. Now, in a similar way, Jesus is the fullness of God's glory, who he is displayed, made known to us. And the claim of the Gospels is that no masterpiece of God in all of creation that you can see, even the majestic Table Mountain, can compare to the Word became flesh. As Jesus would put it, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You see God in Jesus. And Jesus is able to make God fully known because He Himself is God and is in closest relationship with the Father. As verse 18 put it, He's in the bosom of the Father. He's the second person of the Trinity, the three-in-one God who is an eternal community. Jesus is literally God made visible. Or to use Paul's words, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And everyone who has witnessed Jesus when he was on earth and who takes the time to know Jesus by the words recorded by those who saw him. That's what the Gospels are. The claim is you are incredibly privileged because prior to the arrival of Jesus, no one has ever seen God. Everyone prior to Jesus only saw God's glory in a veiled way, a form of God's glory, not the fullness thereof. They never saw the artwork in all its splendor or the artist in all its splendor. Moses only saw the afterglow of God's glory, Exodus 33 to 34. Isaiah only saw the hem of God's royal garments in Isaiah 6. The Old Testament is like a trailer of the full motion picture, a sneak peek to when God will reveal His glory in all its fullness. At that point, before the arrival of Jesus, no one was allowed entry to see God's glory in all its fullness. But here's the thing. What surprised, shocked people in Jesus' day, people who knew the Old Testament, the blueprint of Jesus, who were anticipating Him, looking for Him, and that still surprises and shocks people today when they do take the time to look upon Him and to see Him in the Gospels. What shocks and surprised people is how God revealed His glory, made Himself known, showed to the world his worthiness, His weightiness, His worth, His weight in gold, that we dedicate our entire lives to Him, all our love, all our entire selves. 
It's how he did it. God did not reveal the fullness of his glory by the ten plagues, the opening of the Red Sea, the descending upon Mount Sinai, and leading Israel by a fiery pillar through the wilderness that we see in Exodus and Numbers. God did not reveal the fullness of his glory by the great military victories of Joshua and Judges and Kings. God did not reveal the fullness of his glory by bringing the Jews back from exile from Babylon. No, the claim is the fullness of God's glory is not revealed in the wonder even of human life or the majesty of creation. The, from the tiniest molecule to the largest star. No, the fullness of God's glory, who he is, was revealed by Jesus hanging on a cross for you. According to Jesus, the moment of his passion, his suffering and his death, that first Easter, will be the moment he will reveal, he says, the fullness of his glory. Where you will see God's weightiness and worthiness and why you should love him and entrust your entire self to him. That moment will be at the cross. <laughs> the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It is there at the foot of the cross where Jesus was humiliated and he was beaten, bloodied, stripped naked, mocked and ridiculed by the world. It's in that moment that God revealed himself in his fullness. It is in the ridiculous that God has shown himself most glorious. Why? Because it's, it's at the cross we see his loyal, everlasting love for us. A love that is willing to suffer our judgment, the wrath we deserve. So that we can be reconciled to him so we can know him be in relationship with him have life in him where we can if we come to him be renewed the sting and poison of sin be removed and become what we were always meant to be god's masterpieces mirrors of who he is to his renewed creation when jesus returns that's the wonder of what is revealed at the cross and so much more if you care to look. So you want to know God? You want to know what God is like? You want to be in a relationship with Him? I hope you see that the answer to these questions, they're not found in yourself. They're not found in the creation around you. They're not found even in the beauty of an $84 million painting. The answer is found by going to the cross and the empty tomb to look upon Jesus, to turn to him and him alone. It is in him as he promises you will find the way, the truth and the life. The way, the truth and the life you have been longing for. And if you do want to turn to him, why don't you turn with me to him in prayer? A prayer will appear on the screen. And I really want to invite you that if the words and the claims of this gospel, you want to investigate, you want to know God, then why don't you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father God, I've been looking for you, trying to know you, trying to understand what you are like in all the wrong places. I have relied upon my own thinking, my own experiences. I have tried to know you in the world around me, ignoring your words, only listening to my words. I have relied upon myself, what I believed is right and wrong. I hid in darkness a darkness I created for myself, away from your light. I've sinned, completely missed the mark of how to know you and be in relationship with you. Father, 
Please forgive me according to your everlasting and loyal love, according to your mercy and grace revealed in your Son, Jesus, revealed at the cross. Father, as I look to Jesus, as I look to what you have done for me at the cross, as I see you revealed in Jesus, as I trust in him alone, fill my heart with the assurance of your love, your forgiveness, your acceptance of me in Christ. Father, enable me by your Spirit to know you, love you, and rejoice in you as you love me and know me in Jesus alone. Amen. What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscience all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into the sea Without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many His mercy is to know Jesus here and abroad via our mission partners and one way that you can partner with us in this mission is by giving if you want to support gospel centered ministry here at St. Peter's then please make use of the banking details on the screen also just a reminder about the prayer meeting tonight at 6 on zoom please log on and join us as we pray as a family together and before I go let me close from reading John chapter 1 verses 16 to 18 Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace, already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known.